Hello, I'm Spartacus. No, I'm Spartacus. No, I'm Spartacus. No, I'm Spartacus. Hi, I'm Trey. And tonight I am joined by my forever co-host, Caesar Emilius. Hi, Emily. Hello. Off with your head. <laughs> uh, can I get it once more with feeling? And I was going to do the opposite, and that's not fun. <laughs> like the Wednesday off with your head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually haven't seen Wednesday just yet. Oh. So I don't. Well, I won't ruin that for you. Just... So, but since you haven't seen it, off with your head! <laughs> okay, but it's not going to be to the same uh, amount as not having watched The Lord of the Rings, which right. I have. So, at You're... least I have redeemed myself with that. Agreed. Anyway, uh, Emily, would you like to introduce our fantastic ho- guest for tonight? I would love to. Tonight we have a, a multi-talented, multi-passionate uh, guest. He hails from, well, right now, right around Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's he's an actor, he's a comedian, he's a filmmaker, he's won awards. Um, I don't know if he can do a car- cartwheel or not, but tonight we have Jason Allen King, also known as Jason and the Allenots. <laughs> Hello. I wish I knew what he did and then I could do that. Right. Oh, lovely introduction. Thank you. No cartwheels for me, thanks. Same no here. Cartwheels. I can't do one either. No. I can do so many things. Headstand, hands, I walk on my hand. I just can't do a cartwheel. Oh man! Yeah, I'm with you. Can't do it either. <laughs> it just looks. It's just messy. It's just messy. I can never figure it out. Like, is it? How do I get all the way around? I, I agree. There's, I don't know what it's even supposed to look like. There's gravity, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's my legs or my hands, but they just don't agree with each other. And at six foot three, <laughs> trying to do like a cartwheel, it looks more just like uh, trying to plank in midair and just <laughs> plank in midair. Yeah. I don't know if it's supposed to be that Michelangelo exactly like that. I just, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I have no control. Yeah, I think Michelang- uh, Michelangelo is doing a better cartwheel than I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was Michelangelo, right? That was Da Vinci. That's Da Vinci. (laughs) I know you said it, and I went with it, and as I'm saying it, I'm like, wait. (laughs) Yeah, it was Da Vinci. I read the Da Vinci Code. I should have known. That's my my bad. (laughs) That's the whole reason Da Vinci Code exists. That's right. So people know who that cartwheel guy is. Right, the cartwheel guy. The first first person to do CrossFit is Da Vinci, actually. (laughs) Right. That's a real thing. Science. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you for being with us tonight. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be here. This is fun. Yeah. Now, I, I know you're actually from n- not that area. You're from the north somewhere. Yeah. Where are you from? I am. I am a northerner. It's dangerous to say here in the south. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm a Pennsylvania boy. That's, uh, that's where I'm from. So I was born in Pittsburgh. And it's so funny. I was born in Pittsburgh and raised in northeast PA in the Pocono, Pocono Mountains. Okay. Wilkesbury Scranton area, but my family, we still claim Pittsburgh. We haven't lived there in a very long time. But that being said, I, I, uh, I grew up in a great, great part of the state, great part of the country, a, a town called Mountaintop. And uh, I mean, classic, beautiful Norman Rockwell upbringing. It was fantastic. Yeah. Very awesome. Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I moved to the South uh, about 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. It just got too cold. I mean, I didn't have to come down here. It was just one more one more winter was gonna just do me in i was like i'm out of here yeah i I can relate to that i did the same thing i moved from minnesota to south carolina or charlotte area uh and and but i had grown up like near chicago and it's kind of like the pittsburgh thing like i was still 30 plus minutes outside yeah. of the city but when people ask where you're from you just say chicago because you're not yeah. gonna be able to tell them where bolingbrook is <laughs> yeah, no one knows where mountaintop is right i never up, heard like of up it. there yeah no nobody right. knows. <laughs> that's okay it's all right it's our little secret <laughs> and trey's a transplant too mm-hmm. yeah where are you from trey originally from texas uh by way of nebraska and south carolina okay we won't hold it against you trey uh, thank you. You're so magnanimous. <laughs> I say that I have I have so much family in Texas. I I, I like to throw shots at them just because it's fun and dangerous. 
Uh, but uh, I got a lot of family in Houston, so they, every every time I, I say something, they give me a hard time back. They're just like, you better, don't show up around here. No, they don't say that. They're <laughs> so, yeah. okay. so where I grew up, it was like very, very small town. Um, you know those like old Westerns where you have what, a, like a, a tumbleweed going through the town yeah. and it was like, it gets very dusty at times? That's you were the lived. tumbleweed? Oh, gotcha. I, I literally was a tumbleweed trying to do a cartwheel. <laughs> uh, but no, you got out. Just, I did, I did. Uh, and now I live in a very illustrious, uh, actually I live with my partner in a very illustrious part of the town and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Nice. You said Charlotte though, right? You said Charlotte? Yeah. Oh, great. Very good. I'm in Charlotte as well. Ooh. I love Charlotte. Charlotte's my favorite city. I say that Pittsburgh's pretty close. I love Charlotte though. It's been it's been a very good move. So funny, a lot of my family moved here too, and everyone who's moved here they they just thrived. It's such a oh, it's good. a pretty vibrant city. There's just a lot more opportunities in the art than there you know from where I was from. So um, my sister, my brothers, my folks, nieces, nephews. It's crazy how many of us live here now. Uh, but uh, yeah, Charlotte's great. Charlotte's been very very good to me. It's kind of like the north south. I don't know how else to describe that. Like okay. it's got enough northern the northern influence yeah. in it that like you know the news anchors don't necessarily have southern accents and right. the, there's enough northern influence that you can kind of still feel at home if you're a transplant. Um yeah. but it's still in the south. Fair. At least that's yeah. how I felt. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's a that's a bad description at all. And I don't think that's like a you know, it's not like a, a dirty word either. Saying that it's sort of a northern kind of a feel to it. I think uh, you know, people will want different things when they come to a city. And I think uh, a broader appeal is probably a good thing. I'm also a, 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 a urban planner on my on part time. I don't know. Why I'm, saying that, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do like Charlotte. <laughs> so you're in. You were the one that tried to get the uh, the tolls installed i did I, I make 12 cents uh for every car that goes through yeah you know that's actually why we brought you on this podcast because we need oh. to talk about that this is actually a just second. a roast it is oh my a roast slash intervention yeah that's right it's an intervention like people are coming to get me <laughs> i i was so i was frustrated by the idea of tolls coming and i gotta be honest i use it all the time oh yeah i almost yeah mm. i almost never don't use it when I'm going up there. Also, I'm a very late person, so I'm, I'm always in a hurry. Old? And I'm like, oh, that three bucks will be worth it. Definitely. Yeah. I'm sure for a lot of people it is. It, it would be for me because I don't like doing traffic. Even, yeah. like I said, I grew up near Chicago and I learned to drive in downtown Chicago. And that mm -hmm. was, wow. that was enough. That's enough for me for my lifetime. So I don't, uh, I don't enjoy that at all. So I would pay the $3 or whatever to get past yeah. that. As someone yeah. who has unfortunately driven through downtown Chicago in rush hour traffic on their way home back to South Carolina, <laughs> I just have to say two things. One, God bless you. And two, <laughs> God bless you. It's a, uh, yeah, you can plan, like depending on when you go to Chicago from where I was actually living, you could plan for a 30 minute drive. But then you know it's going to be two hours coming back if you hit anywhere near rush hour. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, but that's kind of like, uh, isn't that kind of like eighty five, <laughs> where it's like, if you... it, I have to say, it used to be. I think. Oh. I don't think it's quite that bad anymore. When the construction was going on, eighty five was terrible, and I know the southern loop of forty five was really bad. I don't know if any of them are quite that bad anymore, but I okay. know that. People are going to start chiming in, just like this guy's an idiot. He just doesn't live around there. <laughs> it might, it might be awful for all I know. But we'll get some I also, email. I don't, I don't work nine to five, so I'm not. I can generally avoid those. Oh yeah. Those times. So, I, I shouldn't be talking about any of this. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have to do any of that. So. Well, we have enough of our audience is not in Charlotte, so I'm sure oh, there's a lot of people that are like, we don't know what 485 is. <laughs> so, but you have a podcast too. I do, yes. Tell yeah, us about yeah. that. It, you know, it's it, for comedians. It's it's such a ubiquitous thing that uh, you know, and 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 I say that, and I, without any sort of snark. And initially, there was some snark there, but podcasts are um, 
they're kind of everywhere and they're they're everyone is consuming them. I just the numbers just keep going up and up and up for people who like podcasts. So so I shouldn't sort of uh, poo poo the idea. All that being said, um, I have a podcast. I'm uh, it's the Comedy Zone podcast. The Comedy Zone is the main club here in Charlotte. It's, pretty, it's the only club here in Charlotte. And uh, so that's, you know, the sponsor. And, and when it initially sort of kicked off, we had we were one of the first podcasts and, and it's part of the Queen City Podcast Network, if you're not familiar with it. Brian Baltashevitz is the uh, the owner and, and sort of operator of that. And I think they have about 53 to 55 podcasts, uh, all that are essentially based uh, in and around Charlotte. I don't think all of them are, I have to say. Um, so I feel like I've gotten in kind of on the ground floor on a lot of this this podcast work because we had headliners coming through the Comedy Zone and, and we set up the podcast in the Comedy Zone in a, in a, a room next to the, the main stage, essentially. So we had, you know, uh, Bob Saget and, and Kyle Kinane. I mean, you name it, we're coming and doing the podcast. And as podcasts become became more popular, fewer and fewer headliners wanted to do our podcast because they had their own or they had the Joe Rogan effect, like all that. So everyone sort of stopped doing that, stopped coming on our podcast. So we've had to sort of make some adjustment. It was basically in contracts and then they would negotiate contracts and those were the things that would come out um coming coming on the show uh now that being said we got we got really into um uh, i wouldn't say all comics but people who are sort of still making their way so it's really fun to get people who are on their way up and people like Catherine blanford if anyone knows who that is she yeah. she's blowing up right now she's li literally just sold out the belly room at the comedy store she's uh, did the tonight show and and uh you know she was on our podcast and it was you know it was great because I'd worked with her in Atlanta and, and we'd sort of become chummy. So, um, so it's been great to do that. And then we have yet again, sort of shifted gears a little bit to making it more of a, more of a comedy driven as opposed to interviews. It's like, we want to write sketches and get characters. And my friend, uh, Kevin Shimko, uh, who is an improviser and, and does all kinds of acting and comedy and stuff. So he's on there with me now. And, and yeah, we're just kind of cutting up and having a good time and, writing sketches and characters and impersonations it's it's just it's a lot of fun so that yeah. sounds like fun awesome yeah. I mean, i'm excited about it. that rant proves how excited i am about it so. <laughs> well and i i've been reading recently on podcast success and they say only 20 percent of all podcasts make it past one episode so wow. the fact that you guys are still doing it at all puts you in the yeah. top 20 percent of all podcasts <laughs> Ah, that's great. I'll Stick. take that compliment. Yeah, yeah. it's wonderful. I, I will I will admit, I'll come clean though, that I wasn't the original host. So we've had um uh this kind of a kind of a, a stepping stone towards success, we'll say. So cool. the original host, Will Jacobs, had um Spencer Taylor on it. She's a Charlotte comedian. And Spencer now she moved to Atlanta. She she left Charlotte, moved to Atlanta to pursue uh, writing and stand-up comedy. Now she she wrote on the show uh, Mixed Dish, and okay. uh, she just did another show, and and I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, so she is becoming this very sought-after uh, television show and screenwriter in L.A. Sammy Joe Francis was the next ho uh, co-host to come in with Will Jacobs. She moved to L.A. and she's been doing all kinds of stuff and acting and all that. So then I stepped in with Will. Uh, and Will Will has has moved on doing a, so many other things. So now I'm kind of solo there, and and I'm hoping the same the same luck uh, you know catches catches me as I did with everybody else. So yeah. So what? How would someone find your podcast? Just so our audience knows. You know, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, as I said, Brian Baltashevitz, uh, uh, he's his network is so efficient and that they just, if so, if anyone has a podcast and is really like looking to get it out there, I, I recommend going to the queen city podcast network. They're always sort of open to ideas. And okay. um, so, but it's everywhere. It's, you know, it's on Apple. It's, I, I, I don't even know all of them because they handle it so well. So uh, I usually go to Apple podcast to listen to it. Okay. It's called the comedy zone podcast. Yeah. The comedy zone podcast is the name yeah. of the show. Okay, cool. That's just so yeah. I want to make sure our audience knew how to find that. So they can sure. listen. Yeah, great. And um, okay, awesome. I, while we were talking, I actually looked it up on the uh, Queen City Podcast Network, uh, which is queencitypodcastnetwork.com forward slash the hyphen comedy hyphen zone hyphen podcast. 
Yes, I want to be very specific about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the current episode that is up there right now, the title is Brought to You by Bread. <laughs> That's right. We have a we have a, a new sponsor of the show, uh, Regular Old Bread. And you can listen to the podcast to hear that. <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, bread. bread. Brett, if you're out there listening, um, we are also looking for sponsors. <laughs> like yeah. I said, please sponsor us. We love you at themodrom.com. That is a real email. <laughs> oh, really? It That's is. Amazing. Yeah. Please really sponsor is. us. We love you is a real email we have. Okay, great. And I check it often enough. Uh, and it also forwards to both of us. So we're not going to miss it. Oh, wow. But we have not yet been emailed there at all. <laughs> Someone yeah. wrote bread. bread? Yep. Bread? Actually, it's specific. It's regular old bread. So if you if you just oh. just buy, buy their products, they're they're helping us out. That's awesome. Um, well, yeah. I do have to say that with Valentine's upcoming, um, if any listeners out there would like to profess their love to us, now that would be the perfect email in which to do so. Just saying. Yeah, we That's we'll take nice. regular adoration emails. That you don't have to sponsor <laughs> us for that. <laughs> Regular adoration email. I bet it. That's great. <laughs> I take those too. I don't know. Yeah, not, I believe you do. It's not just your thing. Like I definitely take those as well. Texts, emails, DMs. Yeah, and you can find Jason at jasonallenking dot com and contact him through his website and send him his own adoration emails. <laughs> Certainly. Adoration emails. He That's has great. a contact form right on his website. You can fill it I out do. many times a day. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> uh, I can't yes. wait. <laughs> I'll read it when I wake up in the middle of the night, lonely. <laughs> wow, that got real sad. That's not a thing they do. I'm, I'm fine, everybody. I'm doing okay. You're like, this is fun. your adoration <laughs> email. Love. Eek. Bread. <laughs> Your name, bread. Bread at nice. bread.com. I wonder if that even exists. I am not a robot. Find all the motorcycles. Well, Big Bread, if Big Bread ever finds out about it, we might be in trouble. If Big Bread it's, finds yeah, out about it. It's like Big Pharma, but it's more wheat. Yeah. It's more okay. gluten. More gluten, that's right. <laughs> More gluten. Bread <laughs> <laughs> so how did you? I want to know how you got here, though. What's your What's your origin story? How How I got to Charlotte, or how I got to doing stand up? To do like yeah, this? like I mean, you're obviously a performer with many facets, but yeah. how did that start? Got all the facets. I, uh, you know, what's funny? I, I was always someone who I, I always wanted to get into to writing, and and that was my goal is always to be a writer. Um, and the irony of having not, I, I was always writing short stories and things like that. And, and then in, I, I can't tell you the year and I don't want to date myself, but I saw the movie um, uh, Pump Up the Volume and I was like, oh, I don't just want to be a writer. I want to write, I want to be cool and write in screenplays. So uh, I started writing screenplays. Fast forward to losing my job at a newspaper. And for the people who don't know, a newspaper is where people used to get their news and you actually, they brought it to your house and you could open <laughs> it up. And fans would get yanked on it and it was amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then uh, a new publisher came in and I lost my uh, I lost my job there. And my family, so my two brothers and my folks lived in Charlotte. And they, basically my brothers called me and they were like, hey, why don't you, uh, you know, get out of Mountaintop get out of Wilkes-Barre and, and come try out a new city. And I said, sure. I moved down there. And then uh, one of those brother, my brother Mike was like, hey, man, you, they do a lot of film work down here. And I was like, what? Uh, so I stopped looking for a job and I started looking for, uh, for film work here. Um, and that turned into a, a 20, even still doing a 20 year long career in, in film production. So I work in, uh, I've worked on movies and TV shows and, and uh, tons and tons of commercials. And I was able to get into uh, pr producing uh, some things, produce a, a feature films and short films. And I, uh, I write and produce with uh, John Schwert. Uh, he, he runs Fourth Word Productions. And so he's a, a writing and producing partner. Um, and, I, you know, so I've worked on all these projects. And, it, and it, we do a video series called George and Monty. 
And um, oh yeah, it's yeah, that's something that we've we've been doing it for years and we love it. And I wanted to be a better uh, a better joke writer in, in screenplay, so I actually took a comedy class at the Comedy Zone. And uh, about three classes in, I said, "This is crazy. Uh, how much fun this is!" I said, "This is going to be a problem." And then fast forward nine years later, I'm I'm, I'm full time stand up comic, still working in the film business. But yeah, that's and that's awesome. that's in, in a nutshell. That's sort of my that's the origin story. Lose your job, everybody. Just lose your job and move to a new city, and then everything wonderful will happen. That's how that's how it works. I think that is. I have been there too, and yeah. I get it. It kind of forces you to make a new start somehow. Yeah. And really think yeah. about what your dreams are and where you want to go. Yeah. I, I tell people, I'm, I, my brothers and I uh, always joke that uh, we won the lottery kind of with my family. I have like my sister and three brothers, like we're all best friends. I mean, no, no, just no issues. Issues get squashed really, really quickly. And we're all just kind of best friends and, and uh so the idea of it of me coming down here and it being a scary thing it's like nothing i do is scary it's a i have such a safety net i have such support in my life that uh you know it's it, it really is a luxury and i don't i don't say that flaunting i say that so to, to, i don't uh, take any of it for granted you know what i mean uh so so they 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 have done a very very important thing in my life to make if make me feel like I can go and take chances. Working in the film industry to me is taking a chance. You know, stopping uh, working on longer projects like movies and TV shows and doing stand up is something that is you know less of a risk when when I get that kind of support. So I've been very very lucky, very fortunate. Yeah, what a great support yeah. system. Yeah, they're great. They're great. They, and I make fun of them a lot on stage because they they earn that too. <laughs> well that's no. you, you gotta use what you know right yeah that's <laughs> that's right they harassed me most of my life and and beat me up and did everything else so it's just it's a little payback you know just turn on a about, bigger scale <laughs> turn about fair play that's right that's right it's still they're still funnier than i am i'm not i am not at all the funniest in my family far from it actually uh everyone's always cutting up and and uh it's it, in my family you got to keep up that's that's how you that's how you get <laughs> that's how you be successful. That sounds wonderful. So your Thanksgivings, yeah. you're just laughing all the time. Absolutely, we're so loud. But I, <laughs> when I invite people over, uh, it's just like just be prepared. This is not. This is it's a little bit of battle here, everyone. You got to your voice has to be loud to you know to be heard, and uh, and it's great. And and I have nieces and nephews and. And we're all just loud people and, and we have a great time and cut up. I mean, listen, we still do Sunday dinners at my mom's. It is oh. very, very Norman Rockwell. Uh, honestly, it's it's kind of a trip. I love that. Yeah. yeah so we're going to come over on Sunday. <laughs> come on. <laughs> That'd be great. If you, know my, if you know my folks, my mom be like, OK, how many? How many people oh. are coming? It's like, she's oh. awesome. She'd be like, all right. Like Thanksgivings that like throughout the years in my house were always whoever couldn't didn't have some place to go. Like my family, honestly, my folks are like literally heroes. Uh, they're just like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. they're going to come over. Great. We'll make we'll set another plate. You know, that's who they were. Are are they're still around. That's 51, great. 51 years, by the way. They just celebrated their 51st wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to them. Isn't that great? I tell them, I was like, I, I bring it up on stage. I don't even do jokes about it because I think that is so rare. And so just wonderful. So, yeah. It is. Awesome. Yeah. Jo no people. jokes necessary. Yeah. I make fun of them a lot. But in, I will say this, I'm not like a mean comic by any stretch. I'm not like, all, all my jokes are sort of innuendo and sort of, I like to think kind of clever. So I talk a lot of, a lot about my parents, but I never, I don't demean or anything like that. I, I It's all teasing and sort of fun things about, you know, them spanking us growing up and things like that. So, yeah. Which they did. <laughs> Like a lot, like a lot, a lot. Oh, a lot. <laughs> <Were you? laughs> I don't know if I should ask. Did you deserve any of that? Oh, or? absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, my brothers and my sister more than me, but I definitely did earn, uh, I earned that. Yeah, we were just knuckleheads. Again, we were never bad. We were just a loud and obnoxious and inner way. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Isn't that what being a parent is? Just get yeah. out of my way. You're getting in the way. Go. Get out of here. <laughs> That's what love is. Love is telling your kids, get out of the way. Go outside. <laughs> it's 
stop it. Don't touch that. No, you can't have it. <laughs> See, Be quiet. And... <laughs> See, and yet, okay. So in full admission, like I've been dating, dating my boyfriend now for uh, probably about seven months. And I don't think we've yet hit that point of like, get out of my way. Um, <laughs> we'll have, we'll have those moments of like playing around and teasing, but yeah. like, I don't think we've quite hit that marker. Yeah. So I don't know whether to look forward to that or I don't know if like to look at that as like a red flag. Oh boy. I mean, are we all just racing to get as comfortable as possible with, with who we're with? Is that, is that what the goal is? Look at that. Speaking of. Oh, Huckleberry. Oh. Huckleberry hound. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yes. He's, he's your Huckleberry. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> I will pay attention to nothing else moving forward. On this. <laughs> she wanted um, to come say hi. Oh, it's adorable. No oh, Huckleberry. Say hi, he is gonna look up the there. sweetest dog. Will yeah. like if you're laying on the ground, he will waddle over to you. <laughs> <laughs> waddle. He's he's part. He's mostly dachshund and beagle, so he he can oh, waddle. That's adorable. <laughs> a little. Show me your look at it. Good Oh, I love a puppy belly. Tofu's going to get jealous. Tofu's my little girl. Aww. Aww. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't trying to interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. No, so Huckleberry was, but I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, Huckleberry's like, there's cameras around. Let's right. go. <laughs> the other thing that I, I do want to comment on is anytime that I see like a healthy family dynamic, I do just kind of want to call that out and say that it puts so much more positivity out into the world. Um, like we had, um, oh my God, we had Lisa DeVita, um, on a couple weeks back, um, and her own son, like wound up being on the podcast, like showing up oh. in the audience. And then she had a friend that she hasn't talked to in almost like 20, 30 years, oh. like randomly show up into, show up into that. So I think it makes such a difference when your family is supportive, like crazy. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. get, uh, but shares in your creativity and supports yeah. it. So I shout out to your family. Shout out to the yeah. King family. You Absolutely. are fantastic people. And we'll see you uh, Sunday. Very sweet of you. And we'll see you <laughs> Sunday. What are we having? <laughs> what are we having? What should we bring? <laughs> what should we have? That's right. Nothing. Whatever you want to drink, that's usually the answer. <laughs> what should we bring? Something to drink. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, that's really sweet of you to say. Yeah, and and I agree. Yeah, especially you know everyone feels like, or or there's a uh, this idea that comics need to ha need to come from you know broken homes and have all this you know trauma in their past. And I'm not saying that uh, that I don't have that. I just don't know if you know severe debilitating trauma is necessarily always the way to to comedy um so just for what it's worth i mean don't get me wrong i have i have plenty of things that i deal with <laughs> uh i just happen to be to be lucky you know when i mm -hmm. tell my dad i was like yeah i think i'm gonna stop i'm gonna do less of this film stuff and i'm gonna do stand up and, and you know takes him about three seconds and goes all right well how do we help you do that you know that's that's mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing pretty great that is how it should be yeah yeah i agree yeah, yeah. good dude yeah, i would say it sounds like it that's yeah. that's the support you you want and need yeah for sure yeah for sure good it, people i'm trying to think of the name of it but you have um you have a dry bar comedy mm -hmm. do we dry, call it a yeah. show is it a, it's a special special yeah, they call okay it a special yeah. Tell yeah. So, uh, yeah, dry bar is, it's really interesting. So in Provo is where they film it. Provo, Utah. Yeah. Um, they have, it's a, it's a company. I think it's called, I think it's called the dry bar theater. And they, they started recording these, these, you know, people that were coming through these headliners and stuff. And they, uh, cause they also have a production company and I think it's called, uh, I'm going to forget the name, the angel something. And, so I think they just combined those two things. So they start and they created a platform uh, called Dry Bar. It's Dry Bar Plus, and uh, it is clean comedy, 100% clean. In fact, they call it it's they call it Provo Clean. Um, okay. When they have uh, 
people come through who are going to perform there, they they have a video and they're like, this is what it means. I mean, it's more than church clean. They don't want you talking about saying anything disparaging about your your wife or marriage or, you know, things like that. So it is a uh, it's it's for the family. And it's it, so so in that sort of niche, it's really kind of wonderful. It's not necessarily the comedy that I seek out per se, but, you know, it, it came out just before Thanksgiving. And I was promoting it like crazy, just saying, listen, you go watch this with your family. You're not going to hear your, and it's like innuendo and things like that aren't really going to fly there either. Like they're just, they really want to make it a family friendly thing. So uh, I, I was really fortunate to get that opportunity and, and filmed it. It's funny. I filmed it about a year and a half ago. They have a very oh. long turnaround before they put it out. And, uh, but it's, you know, I've made the top 10 for, for December and hopefully I can stay up there for, for downloads if people are watching it and, and uh, I'm really proud of it. Um, there's a, it's, it's just becoming this, this thing that a lot of comics that are like, doing well and sort of have that trajectory are, are getting those opportunities. So, so to be in that, uh, in the same conversation with a lot of those folks, I, I feel really good about it. And it was challenging because awesome. it was, it's kind of like right after the, the pandemic was sort of calming down and then there was a spike. So there wasn't as, as many audience members there and they were very separated and you know, there, there's a certain dynamic uh, needed when doing stand up for, for the greatest sort of uh, potential for success. And that's everyone together, cold and dark and low and all this, you know, and, and COVID has kind of turned that upside down. So, uh, but it was still a success and I'm, I'm really proud of it. So, yeah, it's uh, awesome. it, it's called uh, <laughs> the special is called Nobody's Emergency Contact. <laughs> OK, that's the part so, I couldn't remember was the name of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I point out that, you know, I don't, <laughs> I have my folks, my sister, three brothers, 10 nieces and nephews, two great nieces, and I'm nobody's emergency contact. And I'm not sure how to feel about that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's like, wait, is that good? Or am I, oh, I'm the, uh, I'm that uncle is what I've learned. <laughs> like, are you lucky oh, well. or? <laughs> am I lucky? Or is that, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call me either. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well i have a, a side note here yeah. i just got a text message from douglas young who's watching with jillian oh. right now oh that's great they're awesome and i, I was gonna that. ask hey, you douglas, before we hey, jillian <laughs> i was gonna ask you before we started how you knew them i figured through charlotte somehow but um we didn't have time and then with the technical issues so i just thought i'd ask but i'll ask now yeah. And they'll probably. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, we, he just, uh, just the film he just, world. He just texted. Oh, you can't read it. He just texted me. <laughs> Hi, Jason. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. I mean, the, we've worked together for uh, probably nearly 20 years uh, with both of them. You know, awesome. On, on different projects. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. Many years. And they, they're so supportive of of Charlotte and, as a whole, as in especially the arts communities. And, and they, you know, they just yeah. are, are super active. They're, they're uh, just this wonderful people go and take pictures and they're just, you know, and, sh and I think every, a lot of people know or don't know that I think the Charlotte arts community, I think needs help. I don't think it's, uh, is getting the focus and the attention that it deserves. And that goes from comedians to, to improv theaters and actors and imp improvisers to artists musicians i mean theaters independent movies like all of that is is just sort of under underappreciated underfunded and all that and i think you know douglas and jillian are two people who i think are actively out there and trying to just be consumers and supporters and and lifting up uh, artists which i think is pretty great they are really good at uplifting others i have noticed yeah. that as well um yeah, for sure they <laughs> he just his other, t his <laughs> Douglas, I'm going to read this on the show. <laughs> it says, Can we give out Jason's personal contact info in the chat in case anyone needs an emergency <laughs> contact? <laughs> well, he did, he did say before the show, yes, you can even put his mother's maiden name. Oh, you did, right. Oh, I number. did say that. Wait a minute. That wasn't recorded, right? That's not anywhere. Oh, that's a problem. Well, no, see, it's, it didn't record. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if that was legally binding or not. So. They're, they're, he's just asking for friends we don't know. I think that's fair. His social security number is. Yeah. He has LifeLock. It doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll let me know if any, there's any funny business going on. He says he's just trying to be uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas, shut it down. <laughs> shut it down. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't know. Trey, I'm sorry. Did you have a question? My face hurts too. <laughs> My face, I was going to say the same thing. It, like, I'm feeling like Barbie at the end of like Toy Story 2 would be like, My face hurts. <laughs> um, so I, I want to just kind of ask, um, like I know that I as performer, I have very memorable um, like visions. Like I can clearly picture myself back on stage in certain venues is there a venue that has like taken hold of you and you felt in your element or um, is there like a, a particular show that really resonated with you? Hmm. That's a good, good question. Good thought. I mean, there, there's something to be said for, for the comedy zone being my home club, but I, there's, I remember the first time I did a theater, uh, which at the Blumenthal performing arts center here in town, I got to open for Titus. And I remember it did because <laughs> The day in particular was exciting because, listen, I'm still enamored with film and and working in film and, you know, and, and being as someone who's an aspiring actor who probably doesn't put nearly enough time in training and things like that. But I want to do it and getting to stand up and all, and there's some days where you get to do a lot of those things overlap and it's very exciting. And and I, there was a day I was <laughs> I was I got to do a commercial for the lottery where I played a leprechaun. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I remember this. <laughs> it was just a, a just the whole start to finish was so fun and so ridiculous of playing and having prosthetics and a beard and ears being in a pool. And then it was just there was a mermaid. The whole thing it was ridiculous. And I got a call from the um, in, in between uh, while we were filming, I got a call and I missed it. The owner of the club said, hey, Titus is in town. who's just huge name, uh, you know, comedian. He said he needs an opener. Are you available? And I said, "What time?" Gave me the time. Not not really knowing whether or not I would be done or not. I said, "Absolutely, I would love to work with Titus on the theater." And uh, so I went from from you know acting on this thing to racing home to get a shower to get to the club to open for one of the you know biggest you know comedians ever on one of the biggest stages that you know that certainly Charlotte has. And going and, and meeting Titus and having him be so awesome and then having a really good show and bringing him on. It was just, that to me was a, was a pretty special moment to say, oh, you know what, maybe I'm, maybe I am a professional. Maybe I, maybe I am sort of going to be able to do this. Uh, that, that was a pretty special night to, to go and do all of those things sort of in, in, in one day it was, it was pretty exciting. You don't have to be in LA to do those kinds of things, you know? Again, support the arts. This kind of stuff's right. happening in Charlotte. To, to me, that was pretty, pretty exciting. Pretty yeah, time. in in a lot of local cities, wherever you are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I think everyone. People are sleeping on the the mid to, mid to small size cities. Uh, I think everyone usually thinks of Chicago and New York and L.A. and and I think of. You know, I mean, even Atlanta, Atlanta's fantastic. I look at Charlotte, Nashville. I don't know if anyone's been to Nashville lately, but the comedy scenes there's blowing up. There's, mm -hmm. there's so much going on there. Austin, Texas, you know, going, I, I just, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot, of, there's a lot more than just those, the, the big three or four cities. You know? Austin, I can speak to, I had a couple of friends that lived in Austin and were like regular theater performers there and literally every, something happening every single night. So it yeah. could be comedy, live music, a random festival that got organized two days ago, like you name it and it's there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Charlotte's known for NASCAR and the banks, but I, I would say that there's, there's a lot more going on in Charlotte. There's just, there's a lot of talented people here, you know, comedians, actors, uh, improv, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, artists, pa painters, musicians, you know, that there's just a lot going on. I don't know. And it's fun to be a, to be around it all. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's overlap. You know, I go to a place called the Evening Muse here in town where you go there on Monday nights and they have open mics and you'll see these musicians that just blow you away and, that, you know, you wouldn't have known them. They might be passing through town or whatever. It's just, I don't know. It's just fun, fun to be immersed in that. Uh, maybe not the whole country knows who you are, but when you're here and you see these people doing that, it's kind of, 
it's pretty exciting. It's just it's fun. I chase the fun. That's what I do. Honestly, that's a, that's been my my life goal. It's not always been the best decision, but I just I want to go have fun. If what I'm doing isn't fun or enter, interesting or entertaining, again, I'm like, I don't want to do that, and then right. I don't. <laughs> well, yeah, your heart's not in it. Yeah, 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 exactly. I have an English degree. I mean that 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 hasn't really taken me anywhere to do anything as as interesting as what I'm what I'm doing now. Maybe it's similar. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Trace <thought>. thinking. <laughs> I had a thought, I and then my brain like short circuited, and so the the thought left me. We've got um, other English majors out there. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. English majors unite. I do want to clarify. I do. I do have the degree. I don't know if Archer thirty three X is graduated or not, but <laughs> he said, "Yeah, I don't use mine either." Got it. <laughs> 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 I mean, I do write. I just, it's just it's grammar's terrible. So I don't know. <laughs> so. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what language that I'm speaking in, grammar is awful. Um, to my 11th and 12th grade English teachers who drilled it in my head of what a past participle was, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a history to me. That's what that sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. From from all of the, like, with you being a writer, with having worked on other um, film things and television shows, um, who would you say has given you the best advice out of oh, all wow. of the productions that you've worked on? The best advice? Wow. That is, uh, that's a really good question. You know, I would say... A really, that's really hard to put my finger on who because I would say the access to one of the things I didn't realize when it came to to stand up is it's unique in your your access to people who are the best I mean I, I got to host for Bill Burr in Charlotte right uh, Bill Burr is is on a lot of people's Mount Rushmore for the greatest comic to ever do it he's you know he's at least in the top what five six seven and I and I got to sit in a in a you know a ten by ten room and and cut up and talk about comedy and stuff. So, um, it to me, I think it would just be the access you get as a comedian to pros who've been doing it for a very very long time, like David Tell, sitting and talking about comedy with David Tell. Those those are the the in general, I think I, I would say getting access to those people is the answer to, to that question. I don't know if actors you know, get advice from the biggest name actors out there. I don't know. You know what I mean? I don't know if artists get access to the best artists of whatever their medium is. Whereas for stand up, we, we really do. Um, and I think, you know, I've heard, I've had a hundred conversations with, with comics telling you how to succeed, what to do. And, and I, I mean, 99 out of a hundred of these guys are, they want you to succeed. There's no, they're not holding back information. They're not gatekeeping how to be good at this. They, they're they open to giving you the keys to say, here's what you got to do. And a lot of there's overlap on it. And it's, you know, it's stage time. It's this, it's that. But they want to talk about comics love comedy so much. That's literally all they talk about. So, you know, it's easy to strike up a conversation when you feel the same way. So, sure. Uh, yeah. So to say what the, the specific advice was, I, I'm not sure I could pinpoint that, but, um, but it's definitely, I think, comedians in general being open and free to that. Hmm. Yeah. Oh People God. think they're like kind of, I don't, I, I almost curse. I don't, we don't, we don't curse on here, right? You can. Okay. You can. Okay. I was just gonna say shitty, but a lot of people I think see see. <laughs> I did it anyway. Did I it. was gonna. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. He did. Uh, I did, and then I did. It. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, you can. We had uh, uh, Lisa Goldsmith and on with the the Shakespeare. They have a Shakespeare podcast in New York, and they were like, "We're gonna try to tone it down, but we're from New York." It's what they said. <laughs> Were they were they cussing like Shakespeare kind of cussing or was it like modern? Oh no! It, modern. Oh, we should have had him do that too. We're gonna have yeah. him back on. We have him. Uh, <laughs> we're in talks to have him back on, but um, because awesome. we're gonna do like a. 
it, we're going to do like a tournament where we take sh- major Shakespeare characters and we pit them against each other tournament style. Mm. And then we're going to discuss like why Mercutio would have beat Romeo or whatever, you know, and we're wow. going to we'll talk about why. And I they know the characters so well inside and out. I think that would be a really fun podcast night that's like not a typical interview. Oh, I want to know. I, I studied a lot of Shakespeare in college. Okay. It's just like every every class that I did, it, it's like, ah, just pick one of these. It was like Shakespeare. Ah, so I love, that's fantastic. I love the idea of that. Um, I'll let you yes. know when it is. Yeah. Shakespeare cussing is funny too. Yeah. We'll have to get them. In on that. I bet they'd be good at that. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, like a generator too. That's probably cheating, but I still think it's funny. Yeah. It's like a cursed generator. Right. That you can... <laughs> Fi <tough>. upon it. <laughs> 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 Douglas wants to know if this is Twitch After Dark. Yes. Ooh. Yes, it is. Or it's Modern Ro- as Trey likes to say. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the Modern Romantic After Dark. Hello, I am your podcast host, Trey, joined tonight by Emily and Jason. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> wow. <laughs> That was hot. that was pretty it's hot in here. I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. wow. Okay. Well, wow. A lot of people just stopped listening and are <laughs> now with their partners and not in the same room anymore. This or... is. <laughs> I. This will come they, out they, like they're, ma- they're making the beast with two backs, right? That's. <laughs> that's a Shakespeare. <laughs> Anyone knows the beast with two backs? I, <clears throat> I I have to explain that that in particular comment um, <clears throat> it brought me immediately back to my eleventh and twelfth grade English classes. <laughs> yeah. I my junior English teacher, um, we were all just so very naive to Shakespeare and understanding it, and we happened to be reading. I want to say it was Othello at the time, and. We were reading this one particular passage, and we got through it. Nobody reacted. And then our English teacher says, everybody put your book down. She's like, and she read it again. She goes, do you understand what they're saying? Do you understand what they're saying? And almost got on like this like preaching moment um, and just screamed at the top of her lungs. I'm not going to say what she said in class. <laughs> um, but Why not? No. <laughs> But just very made it very clear that Shakespeare uh, was as dirty as dirty could get at yeah. certain moments. And we all just kind of went Wah! with our eyes yeah. and went, oh, I like Shakespeare a lot more. Yeah, oh. <laughs> that's what she knew. People weren't getting it. She's like, you should be giggling right now. You should be laughing and embarrassed by what's that. That's really that's amazing. I love it. Yeah. Mr. Kaiser, Mr. Kaiser was my teacher. He was, uh, he taught us Shakespeare and I was hooked immediately. I don't know. I'm sure he's not listening, but that guy, he was, you know, we got a couple of those teachers in our lives. Mr. Kaiser is one and, and uh, Dr. French uh, at WVU is the other. They And by the way, they were both taught Shakespeare. <laughs> I don't have an English teacher that I reference. Well, I mean, Mr. Kaiser also taught English, but they were the two people and they taught Shakespeare. Isn't that funny? I don't know if it's funny, but it's interesting to me. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, we all remember that teacher, though. That's yeah. That for us. For me, it was Mrs. Booker. Yeah. My sister had the same teacher, so we still bring up Mrs. Booker sometimes. Like if we make a mistake when we're texting each other, we'll be like, "Mrs. Booker saw that." <laughs> <laughs> uh. Actually, Miss, rest in peace, Mrs. Booker, because she is no longer Aww. with us, and. Mm. But we still say things like Mrs. Booker just rolled over in her grave. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. And I'm really sorry to the Booker family if that's not funny to you, but she lives on in our hearts in this way. Yeah, so that's wonderful. we love her. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and Douglas said, I'm lighting up a cigarette right now and I don't smoke. Oh, wow. Oh, I did okay. it. Done. <laughs> that was. F- <laughs> Good job, Trey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Trey, making, making babies from afar. I love it. Good job. <laughs> Jesus Christ. My mom would be so proud right now. She is never going to get a child any other way. 
<laughs> so do you do you remember the first stand up night you did or show you did? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. I well I have what I'll consider two different ones. So taking the comedy class, like they put you up on stage and you kind of do like little things or whatever. And they were like, you should get out, start doing open mics. And then, so I have the first time I ever did an open mic and then our graduation class, which was the first time that was in front of more than like 15 people. And uh, yeah, so, so my, um, um, my very, very dear friend, I love her, uh, Lauren, um, Lauren Weingarten and I, we were dating at the time and uh, she's still like my best friend. And uh, she was the reason why I'm doing stand up. She, she's the one who got, uh, she found out about the class. She knew that I was, you know, aspiring screenwriter, wanted to write better jokes. So she got us, she got us going. So we both took the class together. She's very, very funny as well. And uh, so we went down to, uh, it, it's a, a bar that had a comedy zone in it in Fort Mill. I can't remember the name of the bar, but it was a Fort Mill bar and they had this uh, room in the back. And uh, we went there and we did our first show and what's great is our, we did our first show there when we were just looking up to all these comics who we had seen and, and uh, you know, had never done it before, like Todd Riley, Clint Knorr, sadly, is not with us anymore. Um, Will Jacobs was there. Um, and that was the first time. And, and it was, you know, pretty rough. It wasn't, it wasn't very good. You know, the first time you do it, you're not good at it. Um, and then, you know, six, four weeks later, we had our graduation class with about 250 people in there wow and it was yeah it, it was just bananas to do you know five six minutes in front of that many people when six weeks ago you never even talked in front of that many people ever it was amazing yeah just wow just but and uh, johnny millwater uh, it was a, a just a, a charlotte sort of staple uh, legend of uh stand-up comedian headliner he's he's a fantastic guy he uh, he taught the class and uh he and, he and uh, Debbie Millwater, and she's, they're both very active still. Debbie has uh, shows at the Comedy Zone, and she was also part of teaching it, and Joel Pace was also a part of it, and he, he was with the Comedy Zone. And uh, yeah, they really prepared me for, I, I approached it from a, such an academic place, because I wanted to write better jokes. So I went in there thinking, I'd love to know what, what are all the different jokes? What's the anatomy joke? How do you write a joke? And they literally did all of that for me explain what it was and then you got into the performance side so i felt very prepared uh for doing that and i actually i actually teach a comedy class now oh um I, yeah so I, I our next one starts on the 31st and we do the same exact sort of setup we do six weeks and then a graduation class at the uh, um comedy arts theater of charlotte okay uh, they call it they call it catch and it's a it's a it, they do they have improv classes there primarily improv and some acting and now they they wanted to have a stand up sort of uh, uh, representation there and they and I've gotten to know them I took improv there a couple of different levels improv with them and uh, performed there uh, not quite as much as I'd like it's just my schedule is crazy but um, they have such great brilliant performers there uh, uh, Abby Head and Kevin Shimko they. Uh, own it and run it and they perform there and it's just it is this gem of charlotte that i wish more people knew about would go um but i think it's you know for me it was comedy purists say maybe you should just go and just tough it out on your own don't take a comedy class that they they some people kind of look down on that a little bit i think um and you should just go rough it yourself and learn sure i mean i don't that's not really my speed on anything that I think that I've ever done. I've educated myself before diving into pretty much everything I've done. So the idea of that just what I just wouldn't have done it. And I wouldn't have continued to do it after the, after the class. Uh, but they gave me a really, really strong foundation on how to write a joke, how to, how to perform just basics. I mean, you know, again, nine years later, I'm, I've taken what they've you know taught me and sort of ran with it and learned new things. And I'm trying to, share that with other people so so it's fun to see new people have their first time on stage yeah. and i'm doing i'm having to do the same thing i'm going with them to open mics being like okay fly birds fly little birds go that's so awesome. it's amazing yeah it's been really fun yeah i could see that like there's um like my cousin was like oh i want to go into um kite sail what is that calling where you sail like you are up in the air sailing behind a boat 
Parasail? Oh, yeah, yeah, Parasail. Kind of like that. that, yeah. So anyway, so my cousin wants to get into that and was like, I'm just going to go buy a bunch of gear and do it. But then there's this little stand on by the beach and they're like, you can rent the equipment and try it out to see if you like it. And if you don't, then you just didn't drop $3,000 on a bunch of really expensive gear and you might hate it after the first time. And I think that's yeah. wise, like what you said like taking the class at least allows you to get your feet with feet wet with and learn yeah. some tips and tricks and, and things on performing that of course just diving in sounds really scary to at least the average it sounds scary to me you know yeah. i mean we just did it with the podcast but that's when we started we weren't in front of 250 people thankfully sure <laughs> yeah right so i mean what so i i think that's a wise way to go and i wouldn't yeah. have even thought of something like you said the anatomy of the joke and i went wow that's a thing i never even yeah. would have thought of that yeah so. i mean it's not all not all jokes are created equal they have uh you know a, a, a lot of the same parts but they're not they're just they're not the, always the same you know and i think when you you know a deeper dive is going into writing you know scripts for for television or sketches and things like that and sketch writing is different than than you know tv show writing and i think that's you know even different than you know feature length film writing so those are the things to me that that i just don't know if i would have i would have known that had i not had any kind of training in all those things like i'm still so I'll, I'll, i took a, a workshop not long ago on it was it probably i guess it was december maybe or november uh on uh, it was on joke writing and sketch writing and that you know, it was like a you know, six or seven week course and it, and you never stop learning and you never stop sort of picking things up. So I don't know. Again, the idea of just, I ah, just go and do it. It's like, that's a recipe for failure. That's not a, you know, <laughs> well, because also like, I, I, commu I think community is important, right? When you're going to do any of this stuff. So the idea of you're in a class with some people, none of the people I was in class with, uh, except for Lauren, are really doing it anymore or using it, I, I guess I would say. So, but at the time and, and the, you know, they slowly dwindled, but going with people and having that, sharing that experience with other people who are in the same boat, who boy, being in the same boat, that's helpful no matter what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, so yeah, that's helpful. Sure. And that can feel like support too. I mean, they're, they're watching yeah. you develop. Yep. This yeah. Is... The, the classes we, we've had like three classes now where oh, this will be the third class and we have another one starting in May. If any, and I know there's spots open, uh, go to, um, I think it's catch theater. Um, that's their website. So you can go there to, if you want to sign up for a class in Charlotte. Um, uh, what was I saying? I forgot. I lost my train of thought. I started self promoting and I got all, turned around <laughs> that's okay no that's that's good i i hope our charlotte listeners who are interested go and check that out and if yeah. you're not in charlotte there are potentially comedy type class or stand-up classes near you in whatever area of the country or world you're in um, absolutely yeah uh you could check with your local like if you have a comedy zone or a comedy theater or even a rec center there mm -hmm. might be something sure. there yeah, and I, I've done I've done like Zoom Zoom classes oh. like over the pandemic. Uh, uh, there was people who were giving classes, and and uh, uh, there was a Booker who who's mainly like a West Coast person who I started working with for the pandemic, and they said, "Listen, we we have we know there's a lot of comics out here, and and we're gonna get rusty if we don't keep working." So they were doing Zoom classes, and then they still do those. So you don't even have to necessarily go anywhere. Um, uh, the class I took was with Rich Tellerico and uh, through through Catch through the Comedy okay. Arts Theater of Charlotte. So so a lot of these theaters will have, I know they have uh, uh, Im improvisers who come through and will give sort of different workshops. Some are for the day, some are like weekly, and so a lot of opportunities out there to to get into to performing. Cool. Yeah, for sure. Have you done improv? I have. Yeah, I've taken a couple classes with uh, with Kevin and Abby. And uh, I've, uh, you know, it's funny, I've done, yeah, I have performed, not a ton, not as much as I would like, I'll put it like that. It's, it's a game changer. I would, I would recommend imp improv for literally everybody. It is more than just a performance art, I think I would say. It's, 
it's tapping into sort of your, you know, yourself, your confidence, your trusting yourself. And, and, you know, it also is a, um, it's like a team building thing where the people that you're with on stage and, and the, um, what do they say? They're like, I got your back. It's sort of this ongoing thing where while you're on stage, it's like, if you don't do anything, something right, which I don't think that's even a thing up there is there's somebody else there who's there to catch you and to catch the this, this scene and continue what's going on. So there's just a lot of other things to come out of this stuff. And I think stand is similar in that way that, that it's, it'll, you can tap into something inside yourself. You want to, you want to be a better sort of, at giving speeches at work or talking to your boss or talking to whatever your team is like improv is a pretty fascinating way to, to learn how to be more comfortable in those situations and have confidence in yourself. It's pretty amazing. Hmm. Yeah. Would you say improv helps you? <clears throat> Excuse me. Would you say improv helps you think quicker on your feet? Very much so. Yes, exactly. I think most of the time, and, it, and it's helped me, my stand up a great deal um, for those very reasons. You know, there's one of the things that I sort of uh, talk about in when I'm doing stand up or teaching the classes, there's no mistakes. And that's, I kind of got that a little bit from improv. There's no mistakes. Take advantage of literally everything that's happening. You be aware of what's, be aware of whether it's in the audience, on stage. I've walked out on stage before and there was no microphone in the, it's just hanging there. The, club forgot to put it on oh so so to <laughs> me it's not there's no mistake there there's that is an opportunity what i was able to do was you know make a joke about it you know actually what i did was i it was hanging down with my hand i was like i swear this never happens you know it was the first thing out of my mouth or you know it's like a limp whatever and uh <laughs> the the audience is immediately on your side they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened. So you, so that is such a big step. And so took that, ran with it as long as I could until they brought the mic, and and then we really, you know, kicked off. It was it was fantastic. So that to me is again another sort of lesson for improv and, and your life is like, there's no mistakes, run with it, make it funny, use it, you know. Well, and being training your mind to think like those things are opportunities instead of obstacles or challenges, I think is really valuable because you may yeah. be able to apply that to other parts of your life, not just comedy, just your general outlook and attitude. I think it's, it's directly, I mean, it's a one-to-one -one, it's problem solving. You, yeah. every, everything that happens is not a, it's not a woe is me. It's, it's a, all right, how do I, how do I solve this problem or how do I, make this thing a positive thing and i, I just think it just helps your on out, your outlook on things you know um like i said it's not it's and also make it fun yeah make it fun you know one of the things is is choosing your there's a lot of things that, in, in improv where you kind of choose you make some decisions before you go on stage it's like you're improvising but some of the and, and we would do these uh, exercises where it was like okay everybody this is who you, everyone picks something different you're going to be uh you know grumpy so you're choosing that sort of internally when you go make a decision well for me when i started to do other things it was like all right this the character i'm going to be is this confident then that and that informs everything you do how you stand how you move how you walk if you really get kind of dive into this kind of thing it i, I kind of use it all the time you know it's it's who am i going to be it's, I don't want to be, I don't want to be meek in this situation. I want to be confident. At some situation, be, I want to be aggressive. I want to be, and aggressive doesn't mean violent. It just means, <laughs> it means stand differently. You got, you need to uh, communicate <laughs> in more than just your words. You know what I mean? So, so don't choose violence, folks. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, I want to be like Trey. I want to be and sound very, very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I once had a... <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to gloss right over that. Uh, I, <laughs> I once had a, uh, a person giving a workshop and it was for auditions for like singers and actors before they come on stage and they do their monologue or they do their song. And she said, all right, everybody get up in the line and I want you to treat this like the edge of the curtain and you are going to walk on as yourself and take your place here at this X. 
And so, uh, you know, like the first three people would walk on and um, she'd be like, no, do it again. No, do it again. No, do it again. And over time, you could watch people get more flustered, more flustered, more flustered. And she's like, I know you're getting flustered. I can tell you're getting flustered. And she says, what I notice about every single one of you that has walked on stage right now is that you are walking on with the expectation that you need to walk out here like something other than who you are. So before you walk out on stage, what I want you to do before you even take a first step is I want you to breathe in as you take your first step. So I think there were nine or 10 of us in this workshop. And so we all would like take a breath. And then like step out on stage, she's like, no, do it again. You need to step as you're taking that breath. And her, her mentality on that was you are bringing it, you are breathing in the possibilities of what is about to happen. And if you are already inhaling before you step out and take that first step, then you are not inhaling the possibilities. You are inhaling what you perceive to be your current reality. So I would rather that you walk out on stage with open to opportunities than be stuck in what you're perceiving as the present. And she, as soon as she said that and explained that part, none of us walked out on stage and she went, yes, yes, yes. And she said, what you didn't realize is that as soon as you did that, your posture changed, oh, wow. your head was kept up high, and you walked out on stage like yourself, ready to sing your first piece. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so funny that there's the, the psychology of that tied, tied in with the physicality of it, which is, I think, really impressive. Um, and I think that's that I think they should be tied together like that. Right. They say uh, to, to kind of go along with that, when you step out on stage, the audience, they say, is three, four seconds that they're already making judgments about you. They're already they're drumming up the the. the the, the filter that they have, it's it's just, they see you, they see what you're wearing, how you look, what you're doing, smiling, not smiling, going right to the mic, are you listening to the music and pump, whatever it might be. Some of it you can control, some of it you can't control. So, uh, which makes taking advantage of the parts you can't control that much more important. Um, I'm, I'm a very short man, so I, there are things that I, that I not necessarily need to overcome, but there's a there's this a, a, comedy is tension right it's building and, and releasing tension is what it is when i walk out on stage however many i don't care if there's 10 people there or 400 people there they're all having the same sort of experience when i come out there so tension is built i could come out and make a short joke immediately uh or i could you know give it a little bit of time because I let that tension build and build and build. And who was that? Uh, there's a really amazing comedian. I'm forgetting his name right now. He said he, he was a, a large guy. Uh, anyway, he would he would talk about he would do a couple of jokes and he would say, uh, "Yeah, listen, I gotta hurry up because I, I you know I gotta go have lunch." And everyone would just laugh and laugh. He's like, "I say that because if I wait too long, people will say, well, do, do you think he knows that he's that he's a large kind of.'" that guy and he uses the word fat by the way i don't want to be come off like a jerk and i to me it's sort of a it's just it's fascinating to me control what you can control because there's some things you also can't control hmm. or you or like i said this to me is a way that i do control it you know i definitely talk about it you know most shows okay because it's tension that needs to be released you know use it like the lack of a mic like the lack of answer exactly right. Yeah. Oh, so great. It was so much fun. I walked out there. There, I didn't even have the, as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. You know, you took it and you're like, okay, wave it around, you know, it's whatever. It was great. I noticed that like, I'll see um, comedy shows and it, I've never really been to one live that there was a heckler, but the ones I've seen videos of where there's a heckler, I watch every single time the comedian turns it into a joke they use it just like you did the mic mm -hmm. and i don't think i've ever seen it where they didn't where they were just like all right security come get this moron or or, or yeah, they just right. ignore it i've never seen those two things happen i've seen them take that heckler we're gonna address this and now i'm gonna make fun of you 
for being right. the heckler and and now the room is going to be laughing at you because I've yeah and I wondered mm-hmm. if I mean I think that's an interesting way to use that and every time I've seen it used very well do you get training on how to deal with hecklers or have you ever no. had one yeah I, I would say there's a little this is a trend that's happening where there's a lot of comics who post their, there's a couple of reasons for it, but they post their their sort of uh, comic, uh, you know, crushes heckler or whatever it is. Uh, Steve Hostetter is a guy who's like really famous for it, and I and I have mixed feelings about it. Part of the reason why they do it is because you don't want to just keep putting out your material, because other then people are just going to eventually hear all of your material. You're right. And, you know, you want to sort of hold that to your chest so people see it live. Um, I think the average comedian just heckling isn't what people think it is. Heckling is normally it's a bachelorette party who chose to come to a comedy show where you're supposed to sit quietly and it's eight people who want to have fun and have drinks and be and talk and laugh. Well, that's disturbing to the other people that are in there. So then it becomes, Hey, I, we hear you. You know what I mean? This is, you know, that kind of thing. So that's a heckle. Uh, someone who's had too much to drink and is just being loud and doesn't really, their spatial awareness disappears with every drink. Um, very rarely have I had anybody who was talking to me that that didn't either think they were helping or couldn't help it. I've Nobody has ever been like, boo, you suck. Like, get out of here. Right. And that's never that. It's always... It's always sort of a misunderstanding, not really understanding how a show goes and um, a little too loud. Now, the people who are too loud or whatever, it can go south where they become a little bit more aggressive. Um, and the training is on the job. Okay. <laughs> you, people, you could, I think, teach it until you're, you know, you, you, your eyes go blue or whatever that saying is. Uh, and I think until you experience it a couple of times. One thing I, ha- I did learn is, is you always want to, you know, you, you hear people talk about tech- heckling and then it's like they go at people hard and they're just cruel and they're just like insult them and all this stuff. And it's like, that's never, that's almost never the way to do it. That is a hundred percent last resort. Um, it's usually cause you don't want to lose the crowd. Right. The thing about heckling and you want to get you, the idea is to get back to your show get back to your jokes because that's always going to be funnier than the interaction with the crowd so uh so for me it's i don't want to go go at them hard and and you know make them ridicule them which a lot of these guys are are, uh, men and women are doing that and sometimes these people deserve that i think it's definitely and i've got i've seen people earn it and they get harassed to the point where they leave and i think that's kind of you're going to be rude and you're going to ruin the show for all these people who spent all this money and and the 30 people sitting around you can't concentrate on what's going on because you're talking yeah you know what they should be ridiculed get them out of there like they mm-hmm. that's that's how it works i it just doesn't happen quite as often as as you would think so for me it's it's usually a gentle um hey you know we can everyone can hear you everyone's you know so why don't you guys you know I just keep it down. You'll enjoy the show more. They keep it up. It becomes a little stronger and a little stronger until eventually it's like, why don't you get your ass up and get out of here? Because you're the worst. And I don't like your parents because of what they've done. You know, things like that. So, so. <laughs> I've on seen, the job training. <laughs> I've seen a couple of them on TikTok. And I think my favorite one is... Uh, Oh, I can't even remember the comic's name. Ignore me. It'll pop in my head at like <laughs> midnight tonight. Of course. Um, but there are some that are on TikTok that are glorious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, if you get an, uh, uh, an obstinate person in the crowd who's just ruining the show, I, I think I'd, I'd love nothing more than see them get shut down and, and just, you know, to the point where they're asked to leave people in the crowd are like clapping for the comedian to get this person out of there because it's so it doesn't happen in any other business. What's, what's the other art form where people are like allowed to yell back and ruin the show for everybody. Like it's, you don't get that in opera tray. Well, (laughs) wait, wait, wait. I want that to be a thing so bad. Is this real? (laughs) People would um, go to the opera more, I think. 
I I'm would go to the know. opera. Yeah. No. <laughs> Just so, to see the no. heckler. Yes. You know, I'm trying to think if there is ever a show where there is heckling, like <laughs> written into the show. Um, okay. So there is a show, and I can't remember what the name of it is, and it is it is a melodrama parody. So think of like Days of Our Lives, but make it a parody. Yes, um, and this is an say, opera? This is an opera. Um, and it has like commercial interruptions baked into the opera itself. Like it has its own music and everything. It's literally um, the soap opera. It literally is the soap <laughs> opera. Um, That's a, I want to see the soap opera. Um, so I don't remember what it is, but I want to say that there's some kind of like um, audience participation or something like that where they actually heckle. Um, I will do my research and I will I will figure that out. But I want wow. to say there's like one or two shows out there that are like that. It's fantastic. Because that's not was... a falsetto. I got to know what you heckle. <laughs> what is the? I went to. You're see... not using your diaphragm. <laughs> Use your diaphragm. <laughs> Get it together. I went to see Rigoletto and they play, you know, music before the show starts. So people are coming in and they're getting seated and and the curtains haven't opened yet and we're sitting there. And this was at the Blumenthal. And we're sitting there and I leaned to my friend who came to the upper with me and she and I were chatting. Low key. We weren't loud. We were just talking about our plans for another concert we had booked. And the person behind us was like, shh, at us, like really loud, really shrill, like angry shushing. And we were like, like we thought it was okay because the show had not started yet. Well, oh, yeah. Wow. And I was like, wow. I mean, I have been to a few operas now and I have never been shushed like that. And so I was like, like I turned around thinking maybe it wasn't us to turn and make eye contact with the person behind me that was shushing me and it was me they were shushing me us you know and i felt so embarrassed like wow is this was this not okay and this is opera etiquette i wasn't aware of but i talked to someone after who is involved with opera carolina and said hey is this is this a thing that i'm just not aware of and they're like no the show didn't start yet (laughs) i don't know why i brought that up now that i think about it Oh, By the way, heckling. I want to say, <laughs> I think the shush, the sound of the shush is one of the most, uh, I'm, I don't get offended by anything. Someone going, shh, 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 I, I, oh, it is like nails on a chalkboard. Oh, I'm it's sorry the then. Worst sound. No, it's okay. But I'm just, if someone shushes me, it's like, oh, I will, I'm going to come back. I'm going to jump over the seat. <laughs> oh, I'll be so it's... aggressive. Like, ah, I don't like it. I was, the shush was almost louder than we were talking. Like it was. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was aggressive. Uh, we were aggressive. Shush. We were, oh. oh, we were quiet after that, but we were both like, then we're texting each other while we're sitting next to each other. What was that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got, we got Please. heckled in the audience of a. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, wow. I think so. I, you know, well, seeing the look on Trey's face tells me that we, we weren't alone in thinking that this was strange. <laughs> Did you figure it out, Trey? I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm still okay. trying to find the title of it. I'm That's so okay. sorry. No worries. So, Jason, tell me. There was one question I like to ask a lot of the people that come on the show, and I, um, I want to ask you because I'm really excited to hear the answer. And that oh, is, what, what right. is it about what you do? Whether it's writing, whether it's filmmaking, whether it's baking cookies, whatever, Com- comedy, you name it. What is the one thing that makes you go, yes, this is why I do what I do? Oh, boy. Um, man. I'll tell you. I, I would say I've had, I've had a couple of epiphanies, right? And in, in, in sort of my career, my like career life, I would say. Getting into film for the first time, doing my first job was an epiphany. Working 14 hours. I had never worked 14 hours before. <laughs> on anything <laughs> and i'm like falling asleep driving home going oh this is what i'm going to do for the rest of my life this is amazing uh <laughs> yay there was there was like that moment and i would say that that the only thing that was that i think um surpassed that is is 
realizing and then and I'll, I'll get to the actual answer is realizing that I think I have an aptitude for stand up comedy, which is something that I like stand up, but it wasn't it's never an aspirational thing. It wasn't a goal, not in any way, actually. I, to me, it was like film when I was 14. Film seemed like a million miles away and it was I would only be a consumer, even though I had dreams of writing screenplays and I was doing it. It's never going to get there. It's just right. believing you can do it became a thing. But for me, it's. Uh, having a good show having a having a you know a new joke land having um, being in a moment of of you know doing 30 minutes and 15 minutes in you realize that you could just start reading the phone book and this crowd is going to eat it up they're gonna it it when when you get in that that sort of that zone and that's only happened a couple of times. I mean, most shows you have moment little smaller moments, but some shows are just really really good, where every joke you slow down, every joke that you do a mug or a gesture or whatever you hold it a little bit longer, you add a little something to it that wasn't there before. I it just in that just very narrow zone of a place I, I don't think there's anything more fun than i have ever done than than being on stage and doing that it's just and i again i i i want to be a writer i want to write on shows i want to i want to do all this other stuff and i don't think the performance side of this is something that i think combined two things the writing and the performance and the performance i lied myself for a very long time that i that i wanted to act and i wanted perform and i play guitar and i just never played it out anywhere i'm not very good but you know what i mean mm -hmm. and uh yeah so for me it's 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 being in that that spot where things are just just humming and you can do and not you can do anything but all the jokes that you know they're hitting exactly when they should the audience is getting it right when you want them to and you can extend a joke. It, the joke the idea of extending a joke by not moving extending a laugh i should say you tell a joke and everyone's laughing and you just wait for the second wait. It's, there's just nothing like it. There is nothing like it that it just keeps going. Raise your eyebrow. I, 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 I'm using my face a lot when I'm on stage, but I tell a joke and then just kind of even look over this and then you get more. Oh, it's like, it feels like real magic. Like I'm actually a casting spells. It's so much fun. And that high for the rest of the night, it's, it's, Better than any, any drug that I've ever done. And I've tried a couple of them drugs. And uh, <laughs> nothing crazy. But, but it's, yeah, it's a pretty special, unique thing that the longer I do it, the longer you do it, the fewer people who you did it with do it, if that makes sense. And you you get it more and more. It's just, it's, it's a very, very unique occupation. Um, and I feel like, I feel like I'm doing it right so far. And I'm excited about continuing to do it and seeing where it goes. What do you have coming up? I have uh, the, the next three weeks. I'm, I'm doing some really fun stuff. Uh, tomorrow, what's tomorrow's Wednesday? No, Wednesday. Yeah. I'm opening for Simon Gibson at the Comedy Zone. Then I'm at the Wortham uh, Arts Center, opening for Sean Jones in Asheville. And then I'm in the next weekend, I'm in Hilton Head and Palmetto Bluff, doing a couple of uh, shows out there. And the week after that, I'm in uh, Rich. I might be getting mixed up, but I'm in Richmond, Virginia, doing a couple shows. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about uh, all that stuff. In April, I'm doing shows. I'll be, I'm going to be in uh, L.A. and Oregon and Washington. I'm finally getting back on the road. Cool. Uh, I, yeah, because the pandemic sort of shut it all down. So, so actually, the run I'm doing in Washington, and Oregon, I was there when everything shut down. They should, and they were like, you know, the the planes weren't allowed to go and the place I was at said, this is the last show. It was the last show on Saturday. They're like, you better get to the airport. <laughs> wow. So I got, I got to the airport and it was me and about 12 other people sitting at the bar. I mean, the place was a ghost town. It was like, I, we hope your flight goes, you know? So, so to That's be going scary. back there. Yeah. It was, uh, it was exciting. But it was scary. So to be going back to that run again is, uh, you know, all these years later, it feels like, oh, okay. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bookend feels like a reboot yeah kind of cool. that's great yeah. you get to go back yeah. yeah 
Did you figure? Uh, oh, it's so it, if anybody follows Jason on social media, you can find out where he's yeah. going because he posted on his Facebook and his Instagram. His Facebook is um, Jason Allen King, and Jason Allen King. Instagram is King Jason Allen. Mm-hmm. And- I don't know who that Jason Allen King is on Instagram, but I'm gonna fight him because <laughs> he has my he has my handle. I'm just kidding. I don't know. He's for, sure, he's a very nice person. <laughs> <laughs> and then JasonAllenKing.com. Um, yeah. has links to his Twitter and everything else. Trey, did you figure sure. out the opera? Uh, I did, actually. Yeah! So, um, so it doesn't have the heckling like I thought it did, but it's still uh, what I was describing. So the, the show is called uh, Gallantry. It is a one-act opera by Douglas Moore. Uh, and here's the brief synopsis. The opera begins with the announcer presenting a commercial for Lock and Var Soap, the sponsor of the soap opera Gallantry. Uh, the opera begins in a hospital hallway where eminent surgeon Dr. Greg declares his love for anis- uh, the anesthetist Lola Markham. Lola, although she admires Dr. Greg as a physician, is already engaged to Donald Hopewell. When Greg tries to kiss her, he sl- uh, she slaps him. Um, as, they pre- as they prepare for an operation, the announcer interrupts with a commercial for Billy Boy Wax, the waxy wax that spells relax. <laughs> In the operating room, <laughs> Lola realizes that her patient is her fiance, Donald. A chance remark by Donald reveals that Dr. Greg is married after she anesthetizes Donald. That word was said so poorly. Lola, conf- <laughs> Lola confronts the doctor and threatens to expose him. She prevents him from stabbing the helpless Donald with his scalpel and chases wow. her out. Donald wakes alone as Lola returns and warns him about the doctor. The announcer comes in with a closing commercial for Lochinvar. As Lola and Donald sing of their love for each other, Dr. Greg and the announcer extol the virtues of Lochinvar soap and Billy Boy Wax. Wow. So it's not a comedy at all. No, not at all. <laughs> I love that Lola is the character. That's Lola. fantastic. Yes. Wow, that's I ha- that is an opera I want to see first. Yeah, and then that will be the bar that all other operas will be held to. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people would love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people who are trying to crawl through their computers to get to me right now. Right? No, I love. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Patrick from uh, Switzerland is just. Uh texted me that he's coming home just to find jason <laughs> <laughs> so sorry patrick <laughs> i can't help what i like patrick he's he's he's, like. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a friend of ours who's currently in um in switzerland full-time opera singer in switzerland who is mm-hmm. uh, he would oh. find it funny to be honest i'm, I'm just he, kidding would he find it funny that i thought you were going to say a ricola commercial <laughs> Yes. I hope. He's an opera singer. Oh, he's in Switzerland him. doing a Ricola commercial. I could see him singing a Ricola commercial. I, I should ask amazing. him to. Oh, he should film a TikTok, like standing on top of one of the Swiss mountains yes. with that giant, like, thing. Ricola. <laughs> there it is. You could do Definitely. it. Definitely. Yeah, you could do it. Why don't you. We need a new intro, Trey. Why don't you sing us the song for... Yes. Here, let me sing you the song of our people. Goodbye. <laughs> the song of your people. That's awesome. That's great. <laughs> um, Jason, I, I want to thank you so much for being on tonight. This, I, yeah. when I say legitimately that my face hurts, it is meant <laughs> in all the best way possible. I love it. I hurt faces. That's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> um and i have one question for you yeah will you be my emergency contact ah <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely put my number down that is oh. that is the sweetest thing that anyone has ever asked of me and absolutely oh. yes yes <laughs> a thousand times yes <laughs> <laughs> i can die happy <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, um, awesome. thank you you're welcome. Um, Jason, uh, before we close and wrap up here tonight, um, are there any parting words of wisdom or would you like to tell uh, a joke to our audience before we head out? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about telling a joke. I, I've been uh, 
trying to think of the dirtiest joke I can possibly think of right now. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know what? No jokes. I, I would say I'm, I'm full of jokes and, and follow me on all the things. Cause I, I like to, uh, I do a lot of videos and, and I post a lot of things from the, from the podcast. Um, so there's, there's plenty, plenty to be, to entertain people if you follow me on everything and come see a show above all things above follow me and all this stuff come, come see a show i would love to to entertain uh, whoever's listening and, and wants to it's looking for a laugh that's, that's pretty much it hmm. absolutely love it yeah uh so please follow him at uh jason allen king.com or on the socials as we've talked about there to to keep up and to keep active with jason here um if you haven't heard, we have officially been doing this podcast for a year. We made it to a year. Yay! That's fantastic. What a that's monumental. Good job. Thank you. We're still here. We yeah. are still here. It's <laughs> a big deal. Um, so we are available on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon. Um, we want to thank you to we want to give a thank you to everyone who's tuned in, our supporters, subscribers, our moderator Josh, our produ producer Sandra. Um, this episode, along with every other episode, forever and ever and ever, is in memory of Joe Capone, our moderator, fellow comedian, critic, encourager, and fantastic friend. Find us wherever you can uh, tune into podcasts. For updates, announcements, and more, please follow us on social media under Modern Romantic. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a have an Alan Knot day. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget to support your local artists. That's right. Thanks, Emily. We, Thanks, Trey. We love you. Bye. Bye.